So thank you again. So thank you. Uh, and I also um, say some words about uh, how we can use this in compliance assessment and associate it with uh, cardiometabolic uh, health. So um, the, uh, why do we need biomarkers of food intake? Um, I mean, we have uh, the current dietary assessments, which are using um, food frequency questionnaires, food diaries, 24-hour recalls, and uh, they have been uh, developed very much and are actually very good in many ways. Uh, however, they are still uh, quite uh, subjective. Um, they are also time consuming and they are based on memory and food composition tables. But I would say more than memory because uh, not everyone knows enough about foods to know what they're eating, uh, which uh, yeah, I'll come back to uh, during the lecture. And then least, um, uh, 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 not least, they have systematic and random errors uh, that uh, have been shown in, in several studies to affect the outcome. And the overall effect of this is that we need to make the studies larger uh, because of uh, lack of, of compliance. And, and this increases the uh, coefficient of variation here. And therefore, we need larger studies to have the same power. So if we could improve it with biomarkers, that would, of course, be really, really good. Uh, so that's the, uh, the, the question. Uh, and um, in, uh, as part of the joint program initiative on a healthy diet for a healthy life, uh, we had a project called Foodball, which is Food Biomarkers Alliance, where a lot of the groups working on food metabolomics were working together uh, to try and, uh, and uh, develop and, and find as many food intake biomarkers as possible. So just to go shortly over the, the biomarkers, of course, uh, you, you have exposure or intake biomarkers. And not only for, for uh, I mean, food intake, that would be mainly uh, chemical substances. So that would be uh, chemical markers. Uh, but uh, you also have all kinds of other um, exposures that you could have biomarkers for. Uh, you also have some state of, of uh, uh, of health or susceptibility that will uh, be impacted differently depending on uh, these exposures. So this effect is affecting your, your, uh, um, uh, your health differently and also your response. So um, the, um, the food uh, metabolome is, is only part of a larger uh, amount of, of, uh, of, of the exposome, as we heard yesterday, uh, which also includes the drug metabolome, pollutant metabolome. And then we have also the endogenous metabolome where we constantly form a lot of different compounds. So when you're uh, using untargeted metabolomics, as uh, we've been doing mainly, uh, you get a mixture of all of this and uh, you will try to uh, extract the information that is related specifically to, um, to uh, certain foods. Doing uh, this, of course, is uh, depending on the sample, on the sampling scheme, uh, and a lot of other factors that uh, there will not be time to, to go into today. Uh, uh, but we uh, are going to tell today mainly about the urine metabolome. And uh, of course, uh, that would also depend on the half-life of the compounds, what you're able to measure in a urine sample, depending on when, uh, how often you sample. So in the football project, we, uh, we divided um, uh, the foods into many different food groups as, as it's common to do. And within each food group, you have of course a, a range of, of subgroups and specific foods. So for instance, if we take all the foods of animal origin, which is very diverse, uh, you would have uh, the whole dairy area, uh, which is then subdivided again in milk and butter and cheese and so on. Uh, you would have uh, the meat area, for instance, where you have red meat, which has a lot of interest in terms of, of, uh, of potential uh, cancer risk. Uh, the same for certain processed meats uh, and heated meat, um, uh, I mean, grilled, very hard uh, heating. Uh, but all, you also, along the, among the meats, you also have uh, meats uh, or foods that are regarded generally as healthy, such as fish and seafood. Uh, and some of that are, are often seen as, as more or less neutral, like poultry. Uh, and uh, you have a lot of these discussions of, can we measure the exposures correctly? So trying to, to divide this and, and get the food markets is important in order to 
monitor intake and thereby uh, find the relationships between food intake and health. Now, I mean, there are a lot of compounds you can measure, but are they valid as markers? That's, of course, uh, uh, an important uh, question, not only for intake biomarkers, for, for all kinds of markers. Uh, so we tried uh, to, to make a literature search for all the validation criteria you could think of and, uh, and came up with uh, these that have been uh, mentioned in the literature over time. Uh, and among them, uh, you, you uh, have, uh, I'll not go through all of them, uh, but you have several that are related to uh, to um, how robust or, or plausible the marker is, the, the kinetics and time response, and things like stability, analytical performance, and reproducibility across laboratories. So all these are necessary to say that you have a fully validated biomarker. Uh, so you can uh, say, okay, we already know a range of markers. Uh, some of the better validated uh, are here. There are some that are related to, for instance, garlic, uh, allyl uh, mycopturic acid, also called ELMA. Uh, you have proline betaine, which is the most common uh, biomarker of, of, of citrus intake and, and very popular for that reason. It's a very uh, uh, good marker. It's not uh, metabolized uh, very extensively and therefore uh, it's, uh, it's excreted uh, to a large extent as uh, depending on your intake. Uh, you also have markers like ethyl sulfate, which is used in legally or ethyl uh, glucuronide uh, that you can measure in, in blood and in, in urine and in, in hair and other places. Um, there is not very good literature on, on chemical stability, uh, but it is fairly stable uh, according to my own uh, studies. So I think it's a very good validated marker. Um, you also have fish markers, uh, many different, uh, but uh, which markers you are looking for, for instance, uh, pollen saturated fatty acids or, um, or furane fatty acids or trimethylamine oxide, depends very much on which kind of fish, where they live and uh, how they, uh, what they eat. Uh, so you don't have one marker. Um, again, for chicken, uh, there's been a very nice studies from, from uh, Lorraine Brennan's group on, on the guanidino acetate. I'm not sure whether it's fed to the chicken or whether they produce it themselves. So there are some uncertainties uh, relating to, to, to the um, uh, validation. And uh, also something like curcumin uh, is actually been uh, shown in several studies <clears throat> to be a relatively good marker. Or well, there are good markers for curcumin. So. Um, these are just a few. Uh, there are very many others uh, for rye, uh, whole grain, rye and wheat, some legumes, oils, smoked meat, and so on. Uh, and I think today maybe we have some uh, 30 to 50 relatively well validated biomarkers. So how do they perform? Let's take one of the good biomarkers like ethyl sulfate and reported alcohol intake. And uh, you may be laughing, seeing a, a, a regression coefficient here of uh, 0.15 uh, in a very well-controlled uh, um, cross-sectional study uh, of 140 people. So, I mean, not only are we ha do we have people who seem to have a higher ethyl sulfate level in the urine than uh, their reported intake, but you also have some who have very uh, uh, much less than they, what they had. And we were back and looked into the protocol for some of these people. And there is no doubt about their, uh, their uh, recording, whether this person uh, uh, with a very uh, high intake and low ethyl sulfate was having really um, half a bottle of wine or more, uh, or whether it was half a glass of wine, uh, I, I don't know. So you have these things, but also people don't know what one unit of alcohol is. And therefore, they also do not report all uh, correctly, even if they know what they're doing. But it could also be the marker being wrong. So we did a completely independent uh, measurement on a separate uh, second platform of ethyl glucuronide. Here we have two biomarkers. So we can check the biomarker by another biomarker. So this is part of, uh, of looking at the reproducibility uh, of this marker. And yes, it works nicely even on two different platforms and using untargeted metabolomics. It's, uh, it's a very good correlation. So um, there's no doubt the marker is good. The, um, um, both the compliance and the, the knowledge about alcohol is, is, is bad and therefore we get uh, wrong results. So definitely markers are needed. Um, in the football project, we made a lot of uh, small meal studies. So postprandial studies to look at the initial kinetics of markers and to find 
uh, find a, a panel of markers in control uh, studies that could then be validated further later on. So it could be, I mean, banana or beer or meat, red meat or whatever. And then you uh, give a test meal uh, after uh, synchronizing the, the, the meals of, of persons since uh, the day before. And then you uh, sample at uh, several time points, uh, blood and urine. Uh, uh, to to um, get um, the the um, uh, samples and and explore them for uh, potential markers, and you do that uh, by uh, metabolomics. Now we did it by liquid chromatography, um, uh, quadrupole time of flight metabolomics untargeted, whereas uh, but also other means were used, GCMS, NMR, and so on in this study. Uh, so let's take banana. Uh, so for banana, uh, we found a range of compounds. Um, of which none are really specific to banana. Uh, so you have dopamine and dopamine metabolite, uh, metabolite salsolinol. I mean, dopamine is, is also an endogenous metabolite. You have serotonin, also an endogenous metabolite and uh, metabolites of it. Tryptophan, not very special. You have it a lot of different places. Uh, metoxyeugenol is, is relatively specific, but it also exists in several other uh, uh, food uh, plants and so on and so forth. So we have um, then these are also metabolized uh, by uh, human metabolism and by the gut microbiota. So you get a range of different uh, compounds, none of which are really specific. This is probably a common situation for a lot of foods. So what do we do? Well, of course, we can go along and try to uh, validate each of them and see how good they are, uh, uh, do cross-sectional studies. Uh, and uh, dose response studies and see if we can reach a uh, fully validated uh, bio, uh, biomarker of banana intake. Um, uh, however, there is another approach and that is to combine markers. So uh, combining um, four markers here and looking into a cross-sectional uh, study, this time the, the Karaman study in, uh, from the Max Rubner Institute, uh, we uh, were able to show a pretty good area under the curve for this combination. So if you combine several markets, even if they're not specific, you can actually reach uh, uh, pretty good. This was for a, 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 a banana, full banana intake uh, versus none. And this was uh, the 0.87 was for um, a, a lower banana intake and still a pretty good uh, um, ability to, to show uh, yes or no was banana uh, eaten. So this is one approach that we have uh, uh, used a lot. Uh, there are several ways of, of combining markers. One is like we do here, uh, statistically. Another way uh, is to, to choose different components of, of complex foods like beer, for instance, which has uh, several uh, um, uh, processing uh, parameters and, and ingredients that you could find markers for each of them and then make something specific by combining. Um, meat is very difficult uh, to measure by biomarkers. So instead of uh, uh, using um, uh, a combined uh, uh, markers, we use a combined approach. So first we asked um, where they meet uh, reporters or non-reporters. Uh, so you can see here uh, that um, we were uh, answering is a very good marker of, of meat in general, actually, uh, not only of, of, uh, of poultry. Uh, but you also see that the misclassification for non-reporters is relatively high. So small amounts of meat can often be there when people report no meat. Uh, but still pretty good. An area under the curve of 0.97 is, 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 is good. But uh, remember that it's not a perfect marker still. Um, red versus white meats uh, was also very well. But I mean, when what is white meat? Is pork white or is it red? A lot of people will not know. They see something swimming in their soup. They don't know if it's chicken or, or pork, and therefore uh, we will have misclassification. Uh, so, but still pretty good overall. Uh, and uh, and uh, so the markers were. I mean, the, the the model was made based on on intervention studies where we know, and the uh, and then explore uh, using uh, the preview study in this case. Um, now, of course, a lot of markers are. Um, also metabolized uh, by the gut microbiota. So all of these foods are uh, actually the input uh, for our microbiota and they form a lot of different compounds. 
uh, some of them are shown here and these again some of them are uh, then affecting like our age receptor um, uh, they're affecting intestinal barrier they're affecting uh, immune system and so on so you have uh, a whole gut metabolome uh, that is is formed and that you see as part of it and which i would call mainly an effect of uh, of the food uh, because you see uh, the outcome outcome but uh, for a range of food intake biomarkers they are actually products of the microbiome and therefore you will see differences individual differences and you will have to choose maybe a combination of several markers in order to have a good uh, uh, overall combined marker for the food so let's look at a, um, a whole diet the mediterranean diet uh, and here, uh, the UNINA intervention that was uh, done at the, um, um, uh, in, in Napoli um, uh, by, um, uh, by uh, in an intervention here that was part of the uh, dynamic uh, consortium. And um, you can see that uh, we divide into a controlled diet and Mediterranean diet and sample the baseline at two time points later on. And if we look at, for instance, biomarkers of uh, of uh, nitrogen uh, waste, you'd see that in the blood, which is pink, or the urine, which is uh, uh, yellow here, you can see that the the uh, blood compartments often um, having some kind of, of uh, homeostasis, where you see little changes. You saw a decrease with time, but in both groups, uh, and you see an increase in in the uh, in a marker called beta aspartyl uh, leucine. Uh, which is uh, um, a mark of, of, uh, of uh, protein degradation, but not really well understood yet, but we saw it uh, for uh, uh, both um, um, diets. However, if we look in the urine, we can see that there is uh, a, um, a decreased uh, excretion of indoxyl sulfate, which is a, uh, a toxin um, made from tryptophan. Uh, when uh, people have the Mediterranean diet, uh, you also see less of presyl, uh, paracresyl sulfate, which is another uh, of the um, of the uh, um, uh, uremic toxins uh, formed by the uh, microbiota, and uh, also uh, less of phenylacetylglutamine, which is a very good uh, concordance between uh, paracresyl sulfate and phenylacetylglutamine, indicating the same uh, bacterial uh, source. So we can see a, a range of changes, but here we have compounds that are there all the time. They're not intake biomarkers, they're more of effect biomarkers. If we look at uh, biomarkers, uh, here I write not consumption, but that was because the way we administered the Mediterranean diet here, uh, among all the uh, different foods that were giving allergy tannins, uh, walnuts was by far the most important in, in, in the diet that we provided uh, to the subjects. And uh, these are slowly uh, degraded by the microbiota, and you will then see uh, some of these urolithins uh, that come out, and we can see in the urine uh, that we have a major increase in urolithins in the group having a Mediterranean diet. So this is uh, an example of a marker that works despite this difference in, in uh, between individuals in microbiome. But there are people who are not uh, producers of this, and therefore uh, we have a large variation. So maybe it's not an ideal marker. Also, whole grain intake uh, leads to a range of markers that are formed uh, from alkyl uh, resorcinols, uh, from um, uh, uh, benzoxazines, and from other compounds uh, in rye and wheat, and that are then um, uh, increased in urine, uh, as you can see here after um, uh, uh, the Mediterranean diet, which is richer in whole grain. You can see, uh, for instance, cafe acid uh, and uh, diarrhea cafe, cafe acid, but also uh, this one, uh, DHPPA, uh, which is uh, also a very known marker of, uh, of whole grain. Uh, even in the plasma, we saw uh, this change. Now, lastly, I would like to uh, show you uh, some data from um, um, Nordic diet. Uh, the Nordic countries are the ones with in color here. Uh, and although they are uh, relatively uh, small in population, they are very spread across a large area uh, with uh, uh, quite different um, uh, food sources, especially the seas are different in terms of seafoods, but also uh, due to the, uh, the far north here and the, and the relatively southern part uh, like Denmark, you have uh, differences in, the, uh, in what you can grow on the fields. Uh, 
So you have like 2000 times 2000 kilometers across in both directions. And uh, uh, although these Nordic countries collaborate a lot and we have um, the same um, nutritional recommendations. Uh, so therefore we can uh, kind of ask people to eat the same diet in their uh, local understanding. Uh, so we did an intervention study uh, across all the uh, Nordic uh, countries to look at how uh, this uh, was possible to be understood in different countries. So we had uh, overweight uh, people. They were not allowed to lose weight. Uh, so we kept them weight stable uh, during this intervention because we wanted to see if a more healthy diet could affect your insulin sensitivity and glucose uh, um, uh, metabolism, uh, even if you had no weight loss. Uh, so we had um, more than 150 uh, subjects um, uh, who were randomized to the two different groups and we had several time points of, of uh, sample collection. So um, as I said, we have uh, the same uh, recommendations and we have the same central uh, foods. Um, a lot of whole grain is being eaten in Nordic countries, uh, berries and, uh, and uh, uh, seafood. Uh, so uh, our fruit in general, I would not say only berries, uh, but it depends on where you are, uh, which kinds you eat. Uh, whereas the control diet was uh, the more usual diet of, of, uh, of uh, these um, overweight uh, subjects, which would be more refined, uh, little or no berries. Uh, they had butter and saturated fats, whereas we had rapeseed oil in the, in the intervention. Uh, they had less than one times fish a week, whereas there was uh, 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 three fish meals a week in the healthy Nordic diet, and they had a higher red meat intake in the control diet. So there were quite some contrasts. Uh, if we look at the classification uh, based on the urine metabolome, you can see we actually have a very good classification and uh, we can also see that the overlap is not very high between the subjects in the, uh, in the Latin variables here. However, uh, when you um, combine uh, the, uh, and it was the same for the plasma, I should say. So if you then uh, try to take like a P -P, make a PCA of the classifying uh, urine metabolites, uh, you can uh, see a range of markers here that differentiate the uh, control diet, which is poor in substances actually, uh, poor in substrates for the microbiota, and the healthy Nordic diet, which has a lot of different uh, compounds that come from fish and whole grain and berries uh, that are uh, many of them formed by the microbiota. Uh, so um, we also have a, um, another direction here where we see fish and whole grain being uh, slightly different uh, in the directions here. So last, uh, I'll show you this, um, the classifying, the serum metabolites, and uh, the, uh, you will see that you have the same direction uh, but uh, when you uh, look at it, uh, this direction of the more water soluble uh, metabolites, they are, or the, the, I would say the, the metabolites that are uh, directly reflecting the, the uh, whole grain and, and uh, fish, uh, they explain partially triglyceride and HDL cholesterol. Whereas we look at the fat direction, the aquatic fat versus terrestrial fat, we see much more effect and we see effect also on, on, on uh, two hour glucose and uh, uh, on um, uh, ApoB and uh, a lot of, uh, of cholesterol markers. So we actually, by uh, using this as a compliance measure, uh, we do see uh, an effect on, um, on the glucose that we did not see in the, uh, uh, in the uh, um, uh, attention to treat analysis. So in uh, conclusion, um, we can classify the recent intake of several foods, identify misreporting and short-term dietary assessments, identify a range of food intake related biomarkers affected by the microbiome, and uh, look at associated specific food intake markers with clinical effects to form qualified hypotheses re regarding uh, cardiometabolic health. And I'll just put the um, uh, support up here because I think I'm, uh, close to the time limit um, and uh, therefore um, I would uh, open for, for, uh, for questions while I uh, just show a few of the, of the people who support it um, uh, or did all the work here in my group and in football preview uh, in the um, uh, dynamic consortium and in the uh, SUSTIDE consortium. 
Thank you very much, Lars. Um, very enlightening presentation. Um, I'm just checking the question of the answers. Um, so um, um, there is uh, one question I would like to pick out, uh, pick out on site. Um, so Marinka is asking, um, um, let, let's see. I um, oh, no, that, that's just a comment, sorry. Um, here's an anonymous question saying that um, there is uh, shifting dietary gui guidelines for individual nutritions. Um, so um, uh, what, what, how, how would you con consider um, the, um, the or, or how can the um, biomarkers help to, um, to optimize the guidelines for I think, dietary uh... intake? I think the, the objective biomarkers are very important because whenever we don't see an effect of an intervention with healthy foods, we think that person, that the subjects have not been non-compliant, which is the case sometimes, but not always. So what constitutes a healthy diet for the average is not healthy for everyone. Some people will not react it to, to this healthy diet by uh, having a, a good uh, cardiometabolic uh, 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 risk profile but should have a different diet. In order to search that and find the individual diets, I think we need uh, these tools. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Um, then also here, we'll have to move on to the next uh, speaker.